Okay. I'd like to call to order this meeting, the Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee, for uh, September the 9th, 2021. Uh, I'd like to start off tonight. We have some new members that have uh, joined our group, and we're so glad to have them. I'm going to turn it over to Wally if you'd introduce them. We, I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we have two new members that Phil, we, if you'll recall, we, we lost three people, unfortunately, in June. So we, we do have two new members. Um, unfortunately, one had prior obligations, so he was unable to make it, but his name is Mr. Jonathan Cook, and I'll introduce him when he can be here um, at the next meeting. Uh, but we have Mr. Fernando Schiffelbaum with us. Um, and Fernando is, it was a, uh, is a retired Marine. He was a Marine for 22 years, so and then um, has numerous. I'm, I'm wondering, as I look at this list, how you have enough time for us. But um, Fernando is a member of the Beirut Memorial Advisory Board. He is the chairman of the Camp Lejeune Military Retiree Council. He's the previous Chamber of Commerce um, docent to the Lejeune Memorial Gardens. He was um, part of the Council of the Veterans Organization Liaison to City Council, and he's current in current operations at Marine Corps Installations East um, aboard Camp Lejeune. So mm. we welcome him and thank you, Fernando. Yes, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Also, we do appreciate you joining the committee and thank you for your service and your continued service uh, and service to the committee. We appreciate you being a member. Uh, supposedly those that have been members, you should have received from Derek the uh, uh, agenda adoption. So I, I'm going uh, to ask for a, a vote on adoption of the agenda. Motion. Motion. Second. 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 Anybody uh, have any changes they'd like to make? Okay, then uh, we accept the uh, agenda. Like to move on to the minutes consideration. Of course, the minutes for June the tenth were provided to everyone. Did anybody have any changes to the minutes? No changes. Then we will accept the minutes of consideration. So we'll need a motion in. Oh yeah, that's right. Second I'm sorry. And approval. Keep me Thank straight. Thank you. So can I have a motion to accept the minutes? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes. Second. 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 Jack. Okay. We, we accept it. Thank you. All right. Uh, first thing on, on that we need to do tonight is elect officers. Normally that's June done in June 30th, but unfortunately because of <coughs> events, we're doing it, having to do it tonight. So first, uh, you, do we do vice president first or chairman? You can do, uh, so we do this at the uh, first meeting following July 1, um, and this is your first meeting, and um, so you can do the chair or, uh, and then do vice chair, or you can do both at one time, that is. I make a motion that we do, do chair first, okay. and then vice chair afterwards. Okay. All right. Yeah, and then, that's and everybody that means somebody's right, got to right. second it. Anybody second that a motion? Second. Second. All right. So we'll do <laughs> chairs in favor. So if um, and everybody is eligible because you right now, um, Miss Puff would have been the returning chair, but since she's left, there everybody is eligible for both positions. Okay. So can I have a motion from anyone to start with the chair? Who you like to recommend? Anyone? I make a motion that David be recommended for the chair. I second that. <laughs> can I recommend somebody? <laughs> well, you, <laughs> absolutely, you can. <laughs> no, I'm fine with it. So you just need to ask for all in favor. Uh, uh, a vote. A vote, yes, okay. sir. So I guess the, we have a motion to elect me, David, <laughs> as chairperson for this year. Uh, Take a vote on all in favor. Aye or raise your hand. Anybody opposed? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> thank you. All right, Vice Chair, have any recommendation on that? I'd like to nominate Terry. I will Nick. second that nomination. There you go. Well, I think that's good. Okay, any I other? I make a motion to close the uh, <laughs> nominations. No other nominations. Okay, so can I have a vote on Terry for Vice Chair? Raise your hand. All in favor? All opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you, Terry. Mm -hmm. You it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Next thing on the agenda is water and sewer overview by Mr. Wiley. We'll turn it over to you. All right. So <clears throat> we thought it would be appropriate this evening, being that we have um, two new members and then uh, Mr. McCracken, who has only been with us a few months to uh, kind of give an overview of the water and sewer system because this is the water and sewer advisory committee. Uh, and I figured we would kind of start with um, the responsibilities, the purpose responsibilities of, of this committee and then kind of get into um, what you typically do as a committee and the guidance that you provide and then kind of talk about the water and sewer system and give a, a brief overview. So this is a, a citizen panel that's appointed by the city council. And the purpose uh, for this panel is really to establish a pathway for communication uh, with the, um, and engagement with the citizens of Jacksonville. And um, that comes directly from the ordinance that um, establishes the advisory committees, not just this committee, but all of the advisory committees. And this committee specifically focuses on water and sewer, hence the water and sewer advisory committee. And you really do a lot as a committee. Um, you are very instrumental in reviewing the 10-year uh, capital improvement program, uh, especially for focused on water and sewer projects, which um, if you look at that program is the bulk of um, the program. So you have a lot of influence on those projects and uh, you know, involving, being involved in the upfront discussions. We typically, we do that annually, so it's updated annually. We typically start that somewhere around um, the November, December timeframe. And you work on that for you know, typically four or five meetings and make a final recommendation around March or uh, April to city council on inclusion of those projects in the capital improvement plan and it, what will be adopted as part of the budget. In addition to that, you also discuss the water and sewer rates. Uh, you make recommendations on the rates and this committee was very instrumental in uh, asking or advising council to look at a uh, annual approach of you know a, a small incremental increase instead of um, what we had had in in previous you know previous years where we went I think two or three years in a row and had uh, more than ten percent increases. So this committee does uh, provide a lot of recommendations to city council when it comes to uh, the capital improvement plan. The, and the, the budget for water and sewer and the rates for water and sewer. In addition, you, um, I think you're familiar with the document on the screen. Every month we send out and report to you uh, all of the, not all, but a, a lot of the programs that we work on. And, you know, these are, are kind of routine things that have, uh, that are very important to our system, such as, uh, the grease program, you know, in, in the education and inspection it, that goes along with that. And then um, there, you, this committee monitors, you know, new connections, cutoffs, inactive accounts, uh, all of those kind of things. So you, you do, you get those monthly. So this committee follows along with that and, you know, ask for additional information as necessary or provides 
um, recommendations were appropriate. So moving into the water and sewer system, uh, we have uh, our water, drinking water, comes from two primary sources. The first is the Black Creek Aquifer, which is pulled from deep wells. And those wells, the city's wells, are somewhere in the six to 700 foot depth, um, of course, below ground level, below ground. And they are, we pull that water directly out of the aquifer. We chlorinate it as required for the state. And we literally send it into our distribution system. So the water is so pure that it does not require treatment at all. It just, in keeping with state requirements, we do have to chlorinate. But otherwise, it is, um, it is the, um, is a clean source of drinking water. Um, prior to 2000 and about 2010, I think is when our, our new water treatment plant came online because of uh, requirements from the state, we did not have a water treatment plant. So we literally pumped water out of the ground and sent it to our citizens. And as you can imagine, other than ongoing maintenance and cost for pumps and feeding chlorine, it was a very cheap water source. Um, at that time, we were permitted for 4 million gallons a day. And um, we were able to stay within that permitted range. However, because of the Capacity Use Act, we were required state mandate to get out of or reduce our withdrawal from the Black Creek Aquifer, which is what forced us into building a water treatment plant. And over a 15 year period, spanning from roughly 2002 to 2000, well, 2003 to 2018, uh, the city lost 75% of our permitted capacity in the Black Creek. So we went from 4 million gallons a day of permitted capacity to one. And if you'll think of the growth of the city over that same time period, it was, it was a uh, tough demand to meet, which is where, um, and we had to identify a different source, which is where the, um, the city's other source of drinking water comes from. So we also uh, pull water from the Castle Hain Aquifer. It is also a deep aquifer, but not as deep. And it's uh, roughly our wells are in the 200 to 260 foot range in the Castle Hain. And um, it is also a very good water source. Um, and meets uh, most or all of state requirements for drinking water, but it does have taste and odor so and, and organics. So we treat for primarily removing organics and odor and then, you know, obviously for taste. Um, so we have, um, again, two water supplies. We still pull from the Black Creek. Um, we maximize our withdrawal every year. Matter of fact, I think the last two years we're actually running slightly over our permitted capacity, um, which is allowed because we have a water bank where we've banked water up until the time that um, we were required to get out or would reduce withdrawal. Um, so right now we're pulling somewhere around just over um, 1.5 million gallons a day on average from the Black Creek. And then the remainder comes from the Castle Hain. Excuse me, Walter. Yes, sir. I you to make two comments uh, while we're talking about this particular part. One is, where do other municipalities in the whole state get their water from? Is it aquifers? I know the answer, but I'm not sure everybody else does. And the other is, what is the competition that we have with Castle Hain in the, uh, for example, I'm thinking, we don't have sole use of the Castle Hain. We've got to fight with the, the base, among others. So would you explain the competition for the aquifers and why our aquifers are different than what maybe Greenville has? Sure. So um, to answer your, your first question, it, it really depends on location and availability of source water. 
So there are many, you know, if, if you look to the south of us, there are many um, water authorities or municipalities that pull from the Cape Fear, and that's, a, that's surface water. So they're pulling from the Cape Fear, treating and distributing. Um, you mentioned Greenville, they pull from the Tar River. Um, but we have, and then there's some that use a mixture. They pull from groundwater and they pull from surface and use surface treatment. Uh, in this area, surface treatment is really not a viable water source. We do have the New River, but the problem we have with the New River is uh, it really ranges in salinity uh, because at during certain periods, the water, the New River will be almost completely salt and then during other periods it's almost completely fresh in addition there's a lot of organics in it and i don't know if you're familiar with this or not but the new river is the only river that starts and ends in the same county that it's located in so um, the new river was ruled out pretty quickly as a, a viable replacement <clears throat> uh, so the the good thing about deep aquifer wells is they are less susceptible to other contaminants than surface treatment plants are. Um, although the surface treatment plants are very advanced. But that, you know, generally speaking, your the, the deeper aquifer wells are less susceptible to other or outside contaminants. And then um, to answer your your follow-up question, the Omwasa in the city almost have identical water sources. Omwasa um, pulls from the Black Creek and from the Castle Hain, just as the city does. Omwasa um, was part of um, the capacity, capacity use area also, um, as well as many other kind of coastal and, and semi-coastal counties. Um, so they were forced to, at the same time, we were forced to reduce our withdrawal from the Black Creek. Omwasa um, was also forced to meet the same mandate. Uh, and Omwasa serves a larger population than the city does and had a larger withdrawal, which means they had a larger we reduction in withdrawal. And mm -hmm. the in Camp Lejeune pulls all of their water from the Castle Hain. And the concern there is Camp Lejeune is <coughs> located physically between the city and the ocean. And we have to be very careful about saltwater intrusion and moving the saltwater interface, which we'll get into a little bit later uh, when Randa does some of her updates on projects for you. Um, so in this area, the city and um, Omwasa and the base are all pulling from the same aquifers. So obviously there is a concern there, but rather, you know, I don't want to you use the word compete. We actually have a regional water resources group and we meet periodically to discuss concerns. We share concerns that we have with the aquifers. We have group initiatives um, such as a monitoring well network and our hydrostratigraphic framework that we've conducted. Um, some of which you'll hear about in the project updates. Uh, so we work very closely together um, to identify concerns and, um, and actually we bring the state in as part of our discussions. So we work as a group because we recognize that the aquifer does not start in the city and stop in the city. And we recognize that what we do can have impacts on others and they can have impacts on us. So the required reduction from Black Creek, obviously, that's to, to limit the drawdown to yes, sir. make sure the resource is there for long term. Yes, sir. Okay. And what they, the the study, study showed that, and it wasn't just us. I, I'm sure you've been here long enough. You remember the, sound, the, the sign outside of Richlands that sound, uh, yes. said town of perfect water. Yes. They were withdrawing from the Black Creek Aquifer. I know Greene County was big in the – and um, – the noose, it was the noose regional water resources or something. They were very big in the Black Creek and had large withdrawals from the Black Creek. And they, like us, had to spend a fortune to get to meet the reductions. 
So there's, uh, it, it wasn't just the city or on Wassa, it was a regional issue. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With everybody drawing or the people drawing, is there an average about how much is drawn from the Black Creek annually? We have, a, so yes, the state monitors it. It's all available. They have a website that you can see everybody's um, withdrawals. We're required to report monthly. Matter of fact, that's one of the things that um, the one of the responsibilities the water plant has as part of their reporting. Um, and we all have com permitted capacities. And what you'll find is most people are withdrawing less than what their permitted capacities are. Uh, but we have gotten much better at tracking. Um, and, and when I say we, I mean we as an industry, you know, the state included, have gotten much better of um, tracking the recovery levels. And what we found is with all of the reductions in place now have been taken, the Black Creek is recovering at a, um, we'll just say at a very nice rate. Um, much, uh, you know, the idea is we need to manage, we need to recognize that, um, you know, where we have to, we're borrowing these resources from the future. So if we use them, they're not available in the future. You know, we're not, we're not conserving, we're, we're borrowing. So what, we've, um, what we have to realize is that we need to find that sustainable level and we need to use it that sustainable level. Um, and that's really what our group is centered around. And um, so we're very focused on you know, what the recovery rates are, monitoring the withdrawal levels. Um, and what we're finding is that um, especially in the Onslow County area that the, you know, we can show significant, um, it, trying to think of the right word, but incline in water levels in the, in the Black Creek Aquifer and this specifically. Out of curiosity, because I don't know much about it, but what is, I mean, what's an average or acceptable recovery rate for those aquifers? I think one of the challenges is, um, nobody has set an acceptable recovery rate. Um, but, um, I think the best thing to do would, because we can go a long time on this topic is, um, bring in Dr. Sproul to have a discussion on where we sit relative to, um, the Castlehane and Black Creek aquifers. And, um, so Dr. Sproul is, uh, he is a professor with ECU. And um, he has his own groundwater management company, and we use them a lot as a group. The, the regional water resources group uses them him a lot. So it would, and he, as a professor, he likes to talk about this. So he could answer every question plus some that I would, I probably will never be able to learn. <laughs> he's he's the <clears throat> foremost expert in this area. So we can set that up for a future discussion. Okay. Well, yeah. Would like to, since we're on the aquifers, two other things that I'd like you to, the, when you hear about the algae bloom in the noose, <clears throat> or you hear about a hurricane uh, runoff contaminating Greenville's water because we know that runoff from the farms bring the farm chemicals into the river, and you hear those type of things, that is not a threat to our water source, but it is to theirs. The only real threat we have besides drawdown is the ocean intrusion. Well, it, you know, there's, I won't say that's the only threat we have, but that's probably our primary th threat is, you know, saltwater intrusion. Uh, but with, you know, some of the chemical, you know, PFAS is very a very hot topic right now all around the country. You know, it's, it's the material used in Gen X is a PFAS chemical. Um, and you know, it is a liquid that, um, there's questions that we do not have answered yet. Like, can it penetrate confining layers and things like that? So while, um, direct runoff is not necessarily concern, we do have concerns to protect the aquifer from contaminants that um, could happen over time. 
So we are, we'll just say we're much less susceptible. The Black Creek, though, has almost no solid, uh, salt intrusion concerns or the chemical. It's just the other aquifer. Well, the, there was concern. Uh, the saltwater interface is a concern in all of the aquifers because we're so close to the coast. So <clears throat> part of the concern with overdrawing the Black Creek, uh, you know, the, the Cape Fear aquifer is below the Black Creek. So if you overdraw the, the Black Creek, it's actually possible to pull water from closer to the coast inland or to pull, they call it upwelling, pull water from a lower aquifer into the higher aquifer, which could cause your aquifer to go um, salty. So there's still, the Black Creek is still, could still be susceptible if it's not managed appropriately. And that was one of the major concerns. And we have, we actually have a figure that I'll, I'll point that out when we get to it. But compared to other municipalities and water authorities, we have a relatively safe. Yes. We are protective. much less susceptible to contaminants. What is, just real quick, since we're on that subject. The technology, is it not there to convert salt water yet? Or it is. is it too expensive? What, why? I mean, right here on the coast, why aren't we tapping into that? There, some of the coastal <laughs> communities already have reverse osmosis is what, what they use. Um, and I think Omwasa actually has an RO plant. Is there a Dixon plant RO? Um, so... The, the technology is there. It's more expensive to operate. It's more expensive yeah. to construct and really wasn't necessary for what <clears throat> we needed. Um, but is the technology there for the future? Absolutely. But that's a possibility down the road. The reason yes, I'm sir. bringing it up, if it does start intruding more and more, that's a possibility of converting to osmosis of that in, in the future. It's Correct. It is, yes, sir. Saudi Arabia built desalination yeah. plants, and they do not distribute that water to their population. They inject it into their aquifer to f make the aquifer pr press that ocean water out. But Saudi Arabia has a lot of money. Yeah, they do. Yep. <clears throat> All right. So our, our infrastructure is, um, as I said, we have two source aquifers. We have 14 wells and currently have 14 wells in the Black Creek. Um, all of those wells are not online currently. Matter of fact, one through five is currently offline. Several years ago, we had a um, automobile accident that took out one of our buildings. That building housed our chemical feed for wells uh, two through five, or actually one through five. And when that happened, uh, we had to revisit whether we rebuilt there or we looked at um, modifying our well field. And what we decided to do um, with the recommendation of GMA and, or Groundwater Management Associates and Dr. Spool is we actually left those uh, wells offline, the Black Creek wells offline. And what we're able from our other Black Creek wells to meet our uh, weight rate of withdrawal and our permitted capacity. Um, and what we're doing is going back and evaluating those wells because all of those wells are literally located along a road called Wells Road. And what that does is unfortunately limits the spacing between wells and it's withdrawing a lot of water from one area. Um, and, and really to better manage the aquifer, you're better off to spread those wells out and alternating the, alternate them so that you're not pulling from one specific area. So we decided not to go back and um, just put all of those wells back on. We evaluated each of those wells um, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of share some of that information with you uh, when we update projects. But we evaluated those wells and left some of those wells offline. Um, we have 20 Castlehane wells. Those are all in operation. Um, and we rotate those. They, you know, we don't run all 20 at one time. We, we alternate those. They are 
um, spread around the city and some um, just outside of the city. Uh, we have the water treatment plant, which you'll see pictures of in a few minutes. We have nine um, water storage tanks that total 7 million gallons of storage. Our average daily demand is somewhere around 4.5 or 6 million gallons a day. And if you see me look this way, I'm making sure that John agrees with me. Um, and uh, our max daily demand is somewhere between five and a half and six million gallons. And that typically comes in, you know, May, June timeframe. Um, and then we have 250 miles of water lines that we are responsible for maintaining. And uh, as I said, actually, is that right? Or I said four point something, is that 3.8 closer? 4.5 is, right. is right, so I apologize. So here's a picture of our water plant. I know that some people that have been on this board were able to, to attend the water plant and take a tour. Um, but the water plant, um, when we looked at going from the Black Creek and having to find a, another source, um, I, you know, I told you to remember what was happening in Jacksonville between that 2003 to 2018 time frame. Uh, City Council uh, set a vision that they would construct a plant that was able to handle not only the demand that they were facing, but hand able to expand and handle future demand. So our water treatment plant is actually capable of 8 million gallons per day. Now, again, our, our maximum withdrawal is somewhere between five and six so we're nowhere close to that eight so we have um, plenty of growth but that investment at least in the um, infrastructure that they were that we were constructing is already there ready so we have the trains in place um, it's literally changing out um, you know some um, o-rings and and other things and adding uh, membranes to be able to uh, bring the plant up to higher treatment levels. So it, higher treatment quantities, we'll say that. Would you need more wells? We would need more wells. Right now, I think our, our Black Creek wells total somewhere around um, six or seven million gallons, um, but we would need more wells to, to get to the, to the full eight. Um, and then we do, I mentioned that we do odor removal. Um, if you've ever smelled the groundwater, it's got kind of a sulfur smell to it. Um, so this removes the, the odor from the water. The water actually comes in the top, kind of rains down, and they have, it has fans that blow on it that help remove um, some of that odor. Um, and then we have eight pumps um, that pump into our system. We have uh, four high service pumps and four low service pumps. We actually have um, two different pressure systems in the city. Uh, the downtown over to Northwoods area <coughs> is uh, what we call our low pressure side. And that, you know, pressure typically ranges between 45 and 48 PSI. And then the Western Gum Branch over across Western Boulevard in 17 is what we call our high pressure, and that's typically in the 65 PSI range. Um, and what sets that is uh, the height of the Commons tank. But in order to um, in order to overcome system pressure, we have four pumps that are dedicated to the high pressure side, and four pressure four pumps that are dedicated to the low pressure. And then we have one booster station that we can actually transfer water from the low side to the high side. Um, and that helps us in turning our tanks over and water quality. We have before you seven. Go, yes, before sir. you go on to that, for the members of the board, let me say here that we're fortunate the staff here <coughs> is very conscious, maybe because we ask a lot of questions, not to gold plate anything. But when this system was put forth, 
it was $20 million, it took bonds, and it took our understanding to say, do you really need this, do you really need that, and to accept the design in the sense that as the public would not understand it because they don't get the briefings that we do, we could question those things. So it's not something that you should, you should go out and see it and you should understand it. And in the capital improvement plan, there may be another $20 million <clears throat> facility that we'll need to understand and say, well, maybe you need an extra pump or maybe you don't need an odor removing system and have that debate so that we make sure that the enterprise fund, which has to totally fund the water and sewer, is capable of handling that and the rates don't spike just because somebody wants to have a fancy sign out in front of a building. So this is where we really can come to understanding and help when somebody else is like an engineer saying, oh yeah, but the latest greatest thing is to put this in there and you go, but do you need it? And that gives the public the confidence that we as a board are looking after their interest. We have seven elevated storage tanks that total four and a half million gallons of storage. Um, the, the remaining storage comes from a ground storage tank, which is two million gallons right there at the water plant. And we have a half million gallon clear well uh, that's out near Rock Creek. Uh, it's actually underground, but it's out near Rock Creek and it's associated with the Black Creek Aquifer to give us our, our um, total storage. Uh, our seven elevated storage tanks, um, I think all but two under our under asset ma uh, management contract, that current cost is a $255,000 a year. Uh, but we also use our storage tanks or we double as um, cellular towers for some of those. And we have Current lease agreements with AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, um, and Verizon, and we have those on uh, the Commons tank, the Bryn Mawr tank, the, um, I think, two others downtown, downtown. and um, our revenue from those leases total $335,000. So we actually are able to cover our annual maintenance of our elevated storage tank or a little bit better than cover our annual maintenance with our storage tank with cellular lease agreements. Um, so that has been a huge benefit to the uh, water and sewer rate payer because instead of the water and sewer rates having to cover the, that maintenance requirement, the, lease, the leases are actually covering those maintenance requirements. Does that revenue stay within the... It, yes, sir. It stays within the water and sewer rates. Yes, sir. And then we have, moving on to our <laughs> wastewater system, uh, we are unique. Um, the area in blue is the city of Jacksonville. That's city limits. Uh, it's hard to see, but there's a bunch of little boxes inside those, um, inside that blue area. Uh, but what happens is, we collect uh, primarily through gravity sewer mains and we move wastewater uh, toward our treatment plant. The challenge is, as you know, we're on the coast and we're very flat, which makes it hard to move things by gravity. Um, <laughs> but gravity is the cheapest way to move uh, wastewater because as you add pumps and stations, you add maintenance and O and M, and you add electricity cost. So those are reoccurring costs. Uh, so all of the wastewater in the city, um, short of two pump stations, is actually collected and moved through our main pump station, which is right in front of Quartz Plus. It's the two-story brick building right in front of Quartz Plus, and then it is pumped seven miles out of town to our land treatment facility. And this is where we differ from a lot of, of sewer providers and, and municipalities. Um, we do not have a typical wastewater treatment plant. We use spray irrigation, and I'll get into that a little, more, little bit more. But as you can see from that green area, that is technically our wastewater treatment facility. And um, I think the, the city is somewhere around 26 or 27 square miles 
Mr. Thomas, does sound about right. And uh, the, I think the wastewater treatment plant is about 12 or almost 12. So you can see that um, we own a lot of land outside of the city. It's actually um, 7,500 acres of forested land. Um, so we have a total of 600 miles of pipe in our, in our wastewater system. Uh, some of that is force main and some of that is gravity sewer. We have 45 wastewater pumping stations that I mentioned within our collection system. Um, at our land treatment site, we have three large lagoons that you can actually see right there in the aerials. Um, they, they hold 690 million gallons of storage. And um, our, uh, at our land treatment site, our primary crop or cover crop is pine. And we have 7,500 acres of forested pine with 65 miles of site roads. So we also maintain those gravel site roads. Um, and our average influent is 5.4 million gallons a day. And we have seen, um, because of inflow and infiltration, we have seen um, daily peaks in the um, 15 to 18 million gallon range. So we have I and I in our system. So the average water use of four and a half and sewage of five and a half. So you're you're picking up almost a million gallons a day of, of I and I. Yes. Wow. Yes. Which is not uncommon for a, ours is really pretty in pretty decent com yeah, in comparison to uncommon. some. It just sounds like a huge number. Though. It does. Well, well, when you put it in, yeah. it's it's very easy to see, wow. you know, when you put it in specific numbers of how much. And that doesn't count, you know, what people use to wash their cars or water their lawns oh, or yeah. because there is loss there also. Yeah. So, wow. Um, but, you know, we have roughly a million gallons of, on average a day of I and I. Now, those primarily come through those peak weather events and things like, you know, Hurricane Florence is factored right. into that. Yeah. And so, um, but it just shows that we have a lot of I and I, which over time actually reduces capacity in your system, yeah. which is why we do focus projects directly on inflow and infiltration, which Randall will also get to in our presentation. Wally, what's yes. the normal city's uh, waste how do they dispose of their sewage? It, it's, as I understand, most of them dump it into a river in this state? So it, it depends. Um, again, that, it varies by system. Uh, many have, you know, traditional treatment systems where they treat to um, tertiary levels and then discharge into a body of water, and then they have, you know, nitrogen and other limits that they have to comply with. Um, Omwasa actually has, and in, in, um, there's a community right outside of us that actually has infiltration basins where they treat it again to a ter tertiary level and put it in a pond and it goes into the ground. Um, and then we actually treat to a secondary um, level. So really the only two chemicals we feed in our system is hydrogen peroxide. We do that for odor, trying to be good neighbors. And the second is chlorine, and we do that for contact for our operators in the field. So other than that, actually, and those really aren't for treatment. So we have a full biological system that um, is natural. So it goes through, uh, you can kind of see the domino <clears throat> boards right there on the aerial. Yeah. Um, those are aerated treatment trains, so the water... Um, comes through a, a, uh, a headworks that removes solids and grit and those kind of things. And literally, we pull it right out and we take it to the landfill. And then once we've removed those solids, it goes through natural aeration process. And then from there, it goes into our lagoons where it's held. Um, and really, they, they act a little bit like clarifying ponds because 
of the amount of storage that we have, you know, they spend time in there. So there's, there is some additional treatment gained uh, in, the, in the ponds. And then final treatment is actual irrigation on the floor, forest. Why did uh, Jacksonville get out of Sturgeon City and dumping it as every other city does and go to this more complex? So we had, um, you know, the, that predates me, but um, the short answer is, the treatment process that we were using did not work sufficiently, and we ended up damaging Wilson Bay and, and you know a portion of the New River. So the city spent the the city council made the decision to get out of Wilson Bay, build this treatment facility. It was actually constructed in 1999, um, and move to um, spray irrigation. And we're actually I think we are the third largest in the country as in terms of spray irrigation. In our collection system within the city, we have 280 um, miles. I think, I think that's actually closer to 290 miles. Well, we have 280 miles of gravity sewer, and then we have roughly... 30 or 40 miles of force main that connect um, to our pump stations. Uh, so as you can see, we roughly have equal amount of sewer in the city as we have at LTS. Um, we have in our 45 stations, they are, um, the majority of those are duplex, which means each station has two pumps in it but our major stations have at minimum three and main pump station has, I don't even remember five or six, if I remember correctly. So, um, and then we have one major pump station out at LTS that has six pumps also. So we have a large number of pumps in our system and these are not your standard buy at Home Depot or Lowe's type pumps. Um, and then we have um, not all of our list stations have generators. Um, all of our major lift stations have generators, but we have some lift stations that are smaller or in smaller basins that may have longer holding times, you know, instead of, um, you know, some of our major stations like Henderson or uh, Bryn Mawr, which may have, you know, an hour or a couple hours of holding time. We have some smaller stations that may have, you know, a day or two days. And in those cases, we did not see the need to spend um, enough money and ongoing maintenance associated with keeping standby generators at all of those stations. So what we have is, um, all of our stations have at least a, a plug where we can just pull a trailer mounted generator up, plug it in, pump that station down and move on. Um, so that's one of the ways that we look to um, save money and ongoing maintenance costs in our system. We have, you know, standby generators at our main stations and then we have um, portable generators that we can ferry around to some of those smaller stations. And then we have um, three uh, trailer mounted, what we'll call bypass pumps. It's literally um, almost a station in itself on the trailer. We can pull it up to a station. We can drop a suction hose into the wet well and hook it up to the force main and, you know, we do that in cases where we have to take a station out of service for an extended period of time, or like in Hurricane Florence where we had flooding at um, Ellis and Brookview where we lost controls to those stations. Um, we brought the, and main pump station, we brought in portable bypass pumps that were fully contained that we can hook up and um, pump, you know, continue operation. And then we have um, three jet trucks, and you can actually see uh, a picture there of one of our larger jet trucks where they're out working and, and cleaning in a manhole. Um, and we have, um, every Friday, our jet trucks are dedicated 
to lift stations and cleaning areas of our system um, that are considered hot areas or, or areas of concern where we have either um, typical grease blockages or the line is just so flat that wastewater doesn't move very fast. Um, so solids start to settle out and cause problems. Um, so we, our jet truck fleet is rolling all of the time. And then we also have a camera truck that we can use to um, detour or, or sorry, that we can use to camera um, our system and uh, evaluate uh, all of the gravity sewer lines in our system. <clears throat> Here's a quick overview of our treatment process. I mentioned that it is biological. It is not, you know, is a natural process. So it comes in, the solids are removed. It goes through those aeration trains or those dominoes that I showed you on the aerial. Um, and then it goes to storage and it's actually sent out into the field. One of the challenges that we have that we face with this type of system, and it is great, um, NC State loves us. We have done many partner projects with them, especially um, their forestry division, um, but they have analyzed our system and, um, you know, basically we just went through an extensive study that analyzed our system and looked at whether or not it would be a good system for states in the West that are dealing with um, droughts and crop fails and those kind of things. Um, so we have, we have a great system, but one of the challenges that this system has or one of the limitations is if it's raining, we can't spray. And we've already talked about what happens when... Um, we have major rainfall events. We have I and I. So if we're not able to put out, that means we have to store. We're storing at higher volumes than our normal treatment. And we're storing what comes in as part of rainfall. So that is a limitation to this process. Um, and what I'll say is, um, you know, if, if you look at average rainfall in the I don't know, we'll just say 60, 65 inch range for Eastern North Carolina. At LTS, we put another 50 inches on top of that. So we're, we're literally talking a tropical system at, um, at the LTS with this process. And if I may again interrupt, one of the challenges out there is we will be penalized by the state if we go above the freeboard of those lagoons. And that's something that's constantly being watched and we try to help them figure out solutions so that we don't incur those costs of being fined because so much water is being held in the lagoons. Well, to quote uh, William Brown, who's our chief plant operator, it will go out the nozzles before it gets to freeboard. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we, won't, we won't incur freeboard problems, but you know, we may, we may end up spraying on times that we otherwise would have preferred not to. Yeah, you get special permission for that from the state, don't you? Yeah, we I, do. that, was actually, that was That was criteria then. Yes. And, and we actually have it built into our permit. We can go, we can enter into emergency spraying for things like, an oncoming hurricane or a hur hurricane that's just passed or, you know, a major rainfall. It, it's been, I think it was 2016 or so, but we went in October, we received like 21 inches of rain in a, I think it was over a two to three day period. And that was major for us. Um, but we have in the past incurred the fines. I think it was in 2006 where it, it topped the, and it's, the staff has gotten better at managing that so we don't incur those fines. Yes. It, we, it will not get to free board. We will, we will send it to the field. Well, if I may mention another challenge, which was entertaining uh, before, and it hasn't been shown to them, is when you say solids, some of the things they have to take out is like diapers, Q-tips, 
uh, all sorts of strange things. And I, when I say diapers, I mean adult diapers. And we had one person that was no longer at the, she's moved on someplace else here in the staff, but she used to bring us pictures of saying, this is what we had to take out before we could process the sewage. So the solids are really kind of a challenge because no telling what people are throwing down their toilets. Yes. And a lot of those things, we, I mean, we have found everything from bricks to drugs to, I mean, pretty much anything you can imagine in our wastewater collection system. This is just a, this is a typical lateral. We have 95 miles of laterals that we have to maintain and mow. So there is um, costs associated with that and ongoing maintenance. We have 21,000 sprinklers. Um, but we spend a lot of time, um, you know, really our system is dependent upon the land and the cover crop here, pine trees. So we spend a lot of time um, making sure that we take care of the land so that we can continue it to irrigate. And again, it comes back to the sustainability factor. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that uh, we actually have an entire forestry management program for just the land treatment site. And we have an on-call um, certified forest, forester. Um, so, and he hit one of his biggest focuses is at land treatment. Um, we have logging operations. Uh, it, everything from clear cut to thinnings um, to replantings, we do it, everything associated with forestry management, we handle. Um, and we have, we use the, um, what revenues we do get from uh, the sale of timber, and we put that back into our forestry management program. So we use we use the revenues that we generate from our timber at LTS to help cover the um, the forestry management program. We also associated with the um, water and uh, wastewater. Um, we have two city laboratories. Um, they're both state certified labs. We do this with three people. Um, so we have a supervising chemist who's Amy Palachek and uh, she has two lab techs that work under her and they do everything from daily drinking water samples to um, field samples at LTS, our monitoring wells that we have in our system. Um, so they they are responsible they have a, a broad responsibility um for accountability they do not report to either of the chief plant operators they report directly to me so they're kind of an independent laboratory from the water and wastewater system um, and that's a fairly recent change um, we did that um, probably about 10 years ago or so And then also um, we have the engineering division that's uh, largely involved in the water and, and sewer program. Um, they are responsible for two primary things. One is the review and approval and inspection of infrastructure that is developed with private dollars um, and then turned over to the city for maintenance. So for example, you may have um, an apartment complex that is constructed and they build, you know, they may have to build a lift station or install gravity sewer to get their um, apartment complex into our system. Or they may have to build a water main to get their to serve their apartment complex. Well, they're responsible for maintaining what's internal to that apartment complex but they don't want to continue to be responsible for that which is necessary to get to our infrastructure and that other people can tie into. Um, An even better example of that would be a single family subdivision where you have, um, you know, if you look at Carolina Forest, as it was built out, the developer of the homeowners association is not gonna be responsible for all of that water and sewer infrastructure that went in as part of that development. 
So what we do is we require that that infrastructure be built to city requirements and then we inspect it, we approve the design, we inspect it as it's constructed, and then we take it to city council who agrees that the city will accept it into our system for maintenance. That is largely how we have grown our system. So in the future, if surrounding land develops, then we can bring that through um, our existing system. So the city did not go out and build all 300 miles of water and sewer main. Really what happened is city is responsible for backbone infrastructure and then the individual development is responsible for tying in and extending that. Um, and as part of our water and sewer um, extension policy, we actually require any development that's developing extend water and sewer infrastructure all the way across the frontage of their property. So if they're if they're doing a um, a ten acre, you know, development that's got two thousand feet of road frontage, I don't even know if that ten acres would work, but. If it's got 2,000 feet of road frontage, they've got to build that entire section of whether that's water main or sewer main um, to serve that and to serve not only serve that development, but make it so they can be tied in into in the future. Um, and that again, that's how we've largely built most of our infrastructure. We do have our manual specifications and standards that the engineering um, department reviews and compares the plans that are submitted to. And is that we have things that are built in there, in there that, you know, if a developer constructs a pump station or a wastewater pump station that's to be turned over to the city, then they have to build that station to serve the entire basin, not just that one little development. So it's things like that. Now they do have, obviously there's a cost associated with um, that, you know, oversizing of that infrastructure. And there's different ways for that developer tr to try to recover some of that cost. Um, and we can go into that later. But, um, you know, that is typically the responsibility of the developer. So that's how we have, um, that's <coughs> where the majority of our infrastructure um, has come from. And we've been very beneficial to as a result of a lot of the growth that we've seen and being able to extend that infrastructure. And then the second part of what the engineering division does uh, is they oversee the capital improvement projects and the capital improvement plan. Um, so that plan that you review, it's a 10 year plan, but that plan that you review each year, uh, in the engineering division has worked with um, the water and sewer treatment plants and the utilities maintenance division to try to appropriately um, prioritize projects and get them included into the capital improvement plan. And we'll go, you know, as we get closer, we will walk through uh, what is the capital project and, and what's in the capital improvement plan and how do we decide those projects. Um, but that responsibility falls in engineering. Um, and then as those projects go into engineering and design and then into construction, um, that's also done within the engineering um, division. And that's really all I have for water and sewer overview tonight. I know that was a lot of information and, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we can bring back to you and discuss. Is there any questions? Um, or comments? I've yes, got sir. a request only because I had somebody ask me again today or got in discussion about it. The water bill itself. People, a lot of people don't understand why it's higher than it was 20 years ago. That's because you've added more into it instead of being billed separately. It's all in one spot basically now. If you know, maybe for the G10 folks, if you could explain what's happened over the years, why it went from Twelve dollars, as one person told me today, to ninety to a hundred dollars. They don't, they yes, don't understand that. 
So we try to be very careful about calling it a water bill because it's really not a water bill any longer. It's really more of a utility bill because that, that bill includes water and sewer, which is admittedly the bulk of the bill. But then there's sanitation fee on top of that. And, you know, primarily talking residential here, um, but there's a sanitation fee associated um, that's included, and then there's a stormwater fee also included. And then if there's anything, you know, from time to time, there can be other things included where they have a fine or a, a mispayment or something like that. Um, but really, it covers water, sewer, sanitation, and stormwater. Um, over time, our water and sewer rates have increased, and really... There's two primary reasons for those increases. Um, one is the mandate for us to get or to reduce our withdrawal from the Black Creek Aquifer. And Mr. Nickel mentioned the $20 million water treatment facility. It was actually $23 million. On top of that, you had the 20 wells that we constructed. Um, I actually was the project manager installed over 115,000 feet of pipe with that project. And um, we had to uh, make changes to our system. The total, pro the total price for us getting out of the Black Creek or with reducing our withdrawal in the Black Creek was $47.8 million or something. At the same time, we were under a special order by consent with the state for our wastewater treatment capacity and had to expand our plant. And I don't remember the exact number for that one, but I want to say it was somewhere right at the $50 million mark. So those two projects over, the, over a span of about six years cost the city and water and sewer $100 million. Another thing that happened over the years was, uh, I remember when I first came on, that sanitation, your residential pickup, was and is subsidized by the general fund. Yes. The, the, the fee you see on your bill does not completely cover it. Now, when I first started, it was to the tune of maybe $4 million a year that was subsidized. transferred from your property tax base, basically, to the sanitation to cover it. So each, uh, periodically, it would be recommended, well, maybe we should make the sanitation, which is technically an enterprise fund, but it, it doesn't pull its weight. So I think that fee has gone from, just since I've been here, $5 to $16. So there's $11 a month. And it's going to go that, up slightly. Oh, that's a true. Bit more. And, the, and the recycling debacle is, is yes. upon us, too. So, so that's another factor. Your, your sanitation was being paid from your property tax bill. And now we're moving it. It's still some, but not as great a subsidy. So that's, that's another factor. And as a comparison, before I lived in the city, I actually lived in the county. And this, I've been in the city now for eight years, I think, seven years. Time, time flies. But uh, when I was in the county, I had a separate sanitation service. And my bill at that time was $25 a month. Yeah. And I moved into the city. I'm like, wow, you know, everything we do. And it's, I think it was like $10 at that point or something. And your property tax is only double. <laughs> How about <laughs> that? <laughs> but still, if, if you break it out, it's, you know, well, it's kind of, you know, when you start breaking it down, it is not as far apart as people make it sound, yeah. even if it is doubled. Mm -hmm. And that's not to mention the services you receive, but I'm a little bit biased. Right. Right. So, I, I, I like to take a moment here because I know this has in the past been hard for people to understand. Water and sewer is an enterprise fund by state law. That means it's got to stand on its own. The rates have got to cover the cost. And those things that go up every year, wages... Health care, uh, electricity, electricity and equipment like the the trucks that we were talking about, those things don't come without a cost. Now, 
the staff has been very good because there used to be a thing, what do we call it, facility uh, fee for people to hook into the system, and the state now has gotten involved in that and required those things to be recovered at a better rate so the rate payer is not paying for the business <coughs> to hook into it. But at the same time, the business still got to provide the infrastructure for the development, whether it's a shopping mall or it's a car dealership or it's an apartment complex. But your property taxes do not pay for your water and sewer. It does not pay for the treatment plant or land app. And so when the chemicals go up that the water treatment plant's got to pay for or the land app's got to use, that puts pressure upward. And in the past, independent people have come in to say, this is what the rate should be and how fast. And it was at those time people were like shocked with a 33% increase in price. And the staff and council have allowed consideration that maybe we should tier things. If you're hooked up to the system, you get so much water because you gotta have a basic amount of money to make the system work. And if you're doing that, you get this much water. But then after that, it's tiered as you use more. But there is no going over to the property tax and saying we're short this year. And the reserves the state requires us to have must be there. And the only way to do that is by rates going up. We, as a board, try to make sure that it's really needed for the rates to go up. And at the same time, the system is going to be viable. You may have heard in the news in the last year, several municipalities in other states have had their water and sewer systems fail because they didn't maintain them. We are maintaining ours, even if... We've replaced all the wooden ones. Now we can work on all the concrete uh, pipes. And uh, what, what's that system that you guys use where you line them from without taking them up? They, yeah, we use cured in place lining. Cured in place. Which well, we is, don't have any wood, so we're good. Yeah. <laughs> but clay. again, clay. You, you have to understand, you know, when somebody says, my taxes went up, my property taxes went up, that had nothing to do with your water and sewer. And, and if your water and sewer is going up, we here on the board are trying to keep that reasonable given that chemicals, equipment, capital improvements are necessary and you surely don't expect the people to work for free and not have benefits like health care. We, we right now we are seeing increases in materials and chemicals and things like that. I think our chemicals went up 18, 15 or 18 percent this year. Um, because of shortages, because of the challenges, you know, whether that's related to COVID or, or other things. But, you know, those are challenges we've, we're facing. And I know in the construction industry you see the same thing, but we're seeing almost 30% on pipe that has resin in it. So, and we actually um, had a contractor that requested the bid that we, we spec'd, um, PVC, and they requested to bid it ductile iron because they could get it, and it was, you know, it was a little bit more for them, but they could get it, and Had now, to it. and now it's gotten hard to get, so it's gone up. So it's there is some challenges right now. Yeah, and that's across the board though, to everybody. <laughs> yep. so. And you can't compare our prices if it's because the utility bill includes things like storm water. Or it's because of the way Awasa <clears throat> charges. You can't compare our prices directly with any other municipality or water authority. It just doesn't work. We've tried, you know, to say, hey, you can't even boil it down to price per gallon. And if you look at, you know, we do have areas, uh, you know, the Country Club and Sunset area is actually built by the city, but it's served by Awasa. And then we turn around and pay on Wasso. Well, our rates are, they're very close together now. So it's not, it's not that um, we're very far off of what on Wasso charges for just water and sewer service. The difference is you have all those other things that if you're outside of the city, you pay individually. So you don't think of them right. as being part of your utility bill, you know, instead of a water bill. 
Thank you. So, um, the only reason I brought it up because that's the main thing I hear over and over and over from people is why is my my water bill yeah, so high? That's right. They don't understand that. And I spend half my time explaining why it is. I'm just curious, is it possible sometime in maybe in the water bill sometime in the future to explain that somehow or or so we, can. we we do that it's periodically. Older generation <laughs> that's that that's that way because we remember the twelve dollar water bill, you know, now so well, once we die off the vine, you probably won't have that problem. Well, and a large part of that is because of state mandates. I mean, it, you know, yeah. our, our, our water and sewer portions of our bill going up are largely part of state mandates. Exactly. I was just saying. It's because of that $100 million the city spent 15 years ago. I mean, that's, that's, that's the largest portion of it. So. It is. Yeah. Well, thank you, Wally. We You're appreciate welcome, it. Sir. Great. That was, all right. Uh, well, Randy, are you ready for us? Randy's going to talk about the CIP, the, which is Capital Improvement Plan, and she's going to explain why we're talking about right now, right? Well, I'll go over what we have now. I think Wally touched on some of them. So the first one here is the Castle Hain Monitoring Wells. Um, this one is a collaboration, something that Wally discussed between us on WASA and the Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune. Currently, I believe there's the four that are already completed out at Burton Park. We have four more planned, and that will be out in Hubert. Um, the purpose of these monitoring wells are to, um, I'm trying to think, trying to delineate the red line, which is where the, I'm trying to, uh, the saltwater or freshwater interface and that's something again wally had discussed earlier can i the, add to that yes go ahead. since we have the, this is the graphic that i talked about this was generated by dr sproul um, <laughs> as part of our hydrostratigraphic framework analysis try to say that three times fast mm -hmm. uh, and this was a joint effort between uh, the the water resources group and you can see we're trying to uh, uh, <laughs> delineate that red line which is the saltwater freshwater interface um, and from the left, of, well, let's actually start at the right of the screen. If you see the little blue um, body of water at the very top, that's actually the White Oak River. And then as you move over to the left, um, the, the bigger body of water that you see is really, uh, is the New River and then Southwest Creek. Um, so that can, you can kind of just orientate yourself. And then this is the worm's view. You know, side view, if you cut the earth in half, this is the side. Um, and you can see that really in the, um, the wells are all located um, for the city and um, Omwasa and the base in that, um, in different parts of the Castle Hain Aquifer. And you can see that there's confining layers there. Um, but if you'll notice, you can see that... Um, you have the city kind of on the left side of this view and the base and Omwasa, um, and those would be the Omwasa wells near Hubert, their Hubert treatment plant. Um, and as we talked about, if that's the White Oak River and this is the new river, um, as, as the earth is cut, the right side is closer and you'll notice that those wells are actually shallower. Um, so it's very important um, to find and identify that saltwater, freshwater interface. And um, as part of this project, uh, this project was partially grant funded. Um, and then the city put in some money uh, and Omwasa through an agreement is going to, um, they're actually going to construct the um, wells down in the Hubert area. Um, the city, the city, along with the grant funds, paid for the the um, those in Burton Park, and the Omwasa is going to um, bear the bulk of the expense for the wells um, in Hubert, the the additional wells in Hubert. But also, as part of this, the base that what you don't see is that own base because they have difficulty spending uh, federal dollars outside of the base has also installed through an agreement with us um, around, I think it was 14 monitoring wells or something 
all around base. So, and they're all part of the same network that reports back to the state that we can track and monitor. So this effort is a regional effort. Like I said before, we are all working together to try to, to identify this and manage the aquifer sustainably. Now you're monitoring the level of the aquifer or the chlorine? So they, we, do model, we, we do monitor um, water level, um, and we do that under uh, both pumping and non-pumping, so what we would call static. Um, so we do monitor uh, both, the, both the water level, and then we are monitoring um, for chlorides, which is salinity. Yep. And we do take other analyses also, but that's primarily what we're monitoring for. We also have, and Wally touched on this one as well, the Black Creek well replacement. Originally, after the wells one through five were evaluated, the original recommendation was to abandon, I believe it was two through five, and then rehabilitate one. However, I think we're leaning more towards abandoning two through four, um, rehabilitating well one, and then turning five into another uh, monitoring well. I think that's what we're looking at right now. So, um, but regardless, you know, we knew that two through five, we would not be able to rehabilitate. Uh, the next one is our nano plant chemical feed line and replacement and sulfur acid upgrade. Um, the construction on this one is scheduled to begin this month and that's to replace the chemical feed line as well as the sulfuric acid, um, the tanks and the pad there. Uh, we're anticipating this project to be completed in December, right around December. Um, but along with this one, we also have our SCADA improvements at the water treatment plant and the panel you're looking at here, what's plugged into those are the programmable logic circuits or the PLCs. Um, the SCADA, that controls the wells and the water plant. And this panel here was responsible for our plant going down two times in the last six months. So getting this done obviously is critical right now. So we're working on that. We've actually already ordered and purchased the PLCs. We plan on coinciding the sulfuric acid upgrades with the installation of the new PLCs and the upgrades of that panel. Can we go back one slide for a second? And the question I have is how confident are we going to be that the pad and tank replacement is gonna last longer than the originals? I don't know that um, I don't know that there's much that withstands sulfuric acid. There's not. So, <laughs> I, at some point in the future, this is something that we're going to have to deal with again. Um, I think that uh, we are making improvements to the system. We're changing um, kind of where the pump is located, where some of the piping is located. You know, we've learned some things, but I, largely, you know, there's. There's connections. The, the chemicals are transferred from a tanker into the tank. So any drip, you know, we've never had a major spill or anything, thank goodness, but any drip or just literally the air around the tank is corrosive. And, um, you know, you can actually see it eat through the concrete floor. So we, we are, and it was coated, but we are recoating it. Um, but unfortunately, that's something that, you know, the plant is now 11 years old. Um, so hopefully we get more than 11 years out of it, but there's just not much that holds up the sulfuric acid. So we haven't had much progress in what we could do with the pad, for example. We're putting a chemical barrier down, but, you know, it's, it's the light. It does, those don't have a, you know a 50-year shelf life or anything. You know, that's something that we're going to have to deal Probably with in the future. Probably be about like what we had from the original construction. I, we have to years. do a little bit better, but yes. Okay. There's some that are surprised that we made it as long as we did. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, really quick, as far, so obviously with us trying 
trying to do the installation of the PLCs and the upgrades at the same time as the sulfuric acid. Um, we anticipate this being completed by December as well. Just ask a favor real quick again. For those that don't know what the SCADA system is, can you just kind of do a, a, the 50,000 view of it instead of getting in detail? Mm -hmm. A lot of them may not know what that really is. The SCADA, I, well, I know what it is, but I don't know if I could probably explain it as good as you. I mean, it's the supervisory control and data. Acquisition. Yeah. Acquisition. But it just so allows you to monitor everything yes. as well. Is one, one of the thing I was trying to bring out. It, it gives improved us your whole control. system once you brought that in. That's right. It, it gives us full remote control and um, and monitoring of everything in our system. So um, all of our well sites, all of our generators, um, anything associated with our water system comes through that panel. All of our, you know, our water tanks, whether we're filling them or draining them, everything comes through that panel. Um, so the system that gives you your alarms? It is. Yes, sir. So, and, and the, the two that we've had, and the, the reason that we're having to replace, again, you know, it's microprocessors and electrical components, and they're 11 years old, and while many of them have not failed yet, the problem is we can't buy them either to replace them. They don't make those anymore. So that's really part of the challenge a lot of the programming will be the same but where we literally have to physically purchase new processors for lack of a better term and uh, they're not the same size mm -hmm. so that means that the cabinet's got to change also so and um, what we've been doing is um, using the the what you see is compatible with what's in the well field. So the plan is to do what's to change what's in the plant and then have a storage of devices that we can go to and extend the life of what we have in the field. So it's not like we're going to go in and take this panel out and get rid of it. We're going to take those parts that we could reuse and extend the life of our it, because while there's one, you know, one controller here, there's something that has to receive that at the well fill. Right. So they're talking to each other. So what we're going to do is, since we're replacing this one, we will keep it and try to maintain those that we have in the well, well filled as long as possible. So it, we are not doing, you know, with this project, we're actually doing just what's at the plant but you got to remember everything that's at the plant talks to something somewhere else. So at some point in the future, we'll have to come through and do those. But the idea is to do those, um, you know, a few at a time instead of having to do them all at once like we have to do here. Thank you. All right. Um, here we have, this is the Ellis pump station right after Hurricane Florence. Uh, even prior to this, we'd already had plans to do an upgrade there. When this occurred, this kind of changed a few things. We did start to do some immediate repairs afterwards. They were minor, but um, we plan on obviously relocating the electricals. But the biggest thing is flood proofing that building. Um, we plan on bidding this out. We're, we're shooting for October, so next month. Um, we're hoping the plans will be complete by the end of this month so we can get, get it bid out next month. Uh, again, Wally was talking about the inflow and infiltration. Um, this is just part of our, uh, it's a program we have. It's an ongoing effort to reduce the inflow and infiltration of our sewer system. Um, we do it in different ways. The cured and pipe the cured in place pipe that's one of the projects we have going on which is we call it the triangle sewer project however it covers multiple areas here in the city and yesterday they were doing an area over on tweed um, but the majority of that project is the cipp um, the other we have a few areas where we're doing some point repairs and I think the point repairs, there was one over on Tweed, several in Triangle Plaza, which is the one that's shown right here. 
Um, we're also doing work on Center Street, New River Drive, and Western Boulevard. There's two areas on Western we'll be working on, but each one of these, it's a little bit different, and before we even get to this process here, one of the first things we do is our, you know, our utility maintenance people go out there, and if there's an issue, they're putting a camera down there, the manhole, looking at it, trying to see what the issue may be, whether it's corroded ductile iron or, um, you know, one of the ones we have right now, half the pipe is ductile iron, the other half is clay. So half of it's crushed some, the other half is corroding. So, but it's all one small segment. So, but we're always trying to look for ways that will not be as invasive or disruptive to the community when we're trying to do these repairs. So if we can do the CIPP liner, which is a lot easier than a remove and replace, that's what we're going to choose to do, you know. Um, we also look at cost as well, so. Before you leave that, mm -hmm. uh, as part of our inflow and infiltration efforts, another thing that we do trying to uh, identify areas that need repaired or we need to address or that have significant sources of inflow and infiltration, um, one of the things we do is we use smoke testing. Uh, for those that are not familiar, we basically, everybody's seen the Halloween fog machines or been to a nightclub at some point or something where they have, you know, you have the liquid smoke and it, it blows out. We would basically have one of those hooked to a big fan that we put over a manhole and then we force it down our sewer system. Well, for those of us in the construction industry, every house has a state code required vent stack that ties into the sanitary sewer system so when we are doing smoke testing we we try to be preemptive we put out door knockers um, we've done telephone calls but as you can imagine when somebody drives down the street and sees four houses in a row or maybe ten houses in a row with smoke pouring out the vent stack um, it can create some interesting scenarios. So we, I share that because we literally just went through that situation. Um, we were doing some smoke testing in the Sherwood Basin, which is kind of over near Phillips Park uh, behind Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. And um, it, unfortunately, we, we had staff on site, but unfortunately um, somebody saw it, did not see our flyers, called the fire department, called the police department and, you know, we're convinced that um, there was, you know, four or five houses in a row that were on fire. So um, that is something that, you know, I, I just kind of want to share that if you see a flyer or a notice, we do, we try to be very diligent about putting those out. It's non-toxic. -tox it's not harmful. It's you know, it's what they use in haunted houses or in nightclubs or, you know, it's just literally the liquid smoke you can buy at Walmart. It's not harmful to pets or or anything like that. But um, I, I did want to share that because we have been out doing um, inflow and infiltration investigation. Obviously, if you're going to do that type of testing, it's non-destructive. It's a good indicator. We can flag missing cleanouts. You know, we can flag gutters that are tied into the sewer system that shouldn't be. Um, you know, if you're driving down and somebody's gutters are smoking, then you know that they're tied into our sewer system and they're not allowed to be. So it's a great indication. The problem is it does generate concern and calls. So I, I kind of wanted to use this to, to share that we've been doing that recently. And part of the reason we've been doing that, although... I hear that it's raining now. Um, it's been very dry, which means lower volumes in the pipes, which means we can push the air further. Yeah. So that's why we've been out doing that. So it's, it's really very targeted, you know, historically, um, other than storms, August, September, October, November are very dry times for us. So we do a lot of focused, um, you know, smoke testing and those kind of things during that period. So I did, I did want to share if anybody was in the, I, I, I'm not sure the name of the streets, but Sherwood and Richlands and um, some of the others beside Dunkin' Donuts. Um, it was 
liquid smoke that is non-toxic, not harmful, and nobody's house was on fire. Okay. In regard to the INI program, this is a program that repeats it's cyclic. It used to be a two-year program that repeated every two years. It's now a three-year program. So what we're doing is the construction portion is actually a three-year program. What we've found is it takes time to find all of these. You know, initially when we we did our first, and I was, I was actually part of that program, mm -hmm. we, but we did our first um, INI project. Well, we did our first evaluation in 2007 or eight, and our first INI project sh followed shortly thereafter. And it was, it was about a $3 million project. But we eliminated over 400 and almost 500,000 gallons a day of I and I from our system. So it was very valuable. Um, the problem is we found a lot of those home runs and eliminated those, those large sources. And now we're kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, if we stick with baseball analogy, we're batting singles. You know, we're, we're picking up you know, a base at a time, but it's not those huge numbers that we were initially seeing. But what we're finding is that, you know, we, we do a lot of this through staff time, so we don't have to hire engineers to come in and evaluate our entire system, which is what we did the first time. Um, we, have, we have our own flow monitors that we can monitor the wastewater flow in our pipes, um, and we can move those around. We have our own smoke testing equipment. We have our own jet trucks and our own camera trucks. So we're doing this a lot in-house where before we had to bring that expertise in. Um, but it takes time also. So, you know, we have staff that are making repairs and doing I&I &I work. Um, so it's an ongoing process. So we catalog all these repairs that need to be made and you know if it's as simple as a clean out cap our staff does it immediately or if it's a small little break or a small you know one house tied in then our staff goes goes ahead and takes care of that and cuts it loose immediately um, but if it's major repairs like uh, Randa's talking about with triangle you know this was a mobile home um, area that the owners cleaned up and but if you're familiar with mobile home communities um, mobile homes get moved in and out often sometimes they go from a single wide to a double wide or a double wide to a single wide where or a double wide to two single wides where they're adding taps or removing taps because it is private within their system and we don't have control over it so there are um there are things that, there are, these are good areas to go look for I&I &I problems. Um, so the lines that you see are lines that we maintain um, because we do have infrastructure that runs through here. But some of the like individual, we've worked with the owner and some of the, like the individual lines that served just the mobile home park will not be reinstated at this point. So if they have a, you know, crushed laterals or something like that, they won't get back into our system. Um, so it just, what we found is while we were on a two year cycle, we really haven't slowed down what we were doing. We're just matching the time that in practice, what we were seeing, it was, it was taking us time to gather the information, get it designed, get it bid out and constructed and we weren't getting that done in the two year period. We were saying it was really taking us three years to go through that entire process. So it will repeat every three years. So now. it will continue to repeat, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, the next one here, this is the Western Regional Sewer System. It's also known as Parkwood Regional and Western Trunk Sewer. There's a few, but it's a multiple areas but it's our sewer system where we've been working on this for several years <coughs> now um right now originally we were going to bid out the two segments of the force main um we had everything ready to go out for bid 
unfortunately, the cost of the pipe has increased significantly and will continue to increase, at least that's what we're anticipating. So we've decided to take a different route. We're looking at purchasing the pipe, our, the materials, not just the pipe, but some other things that are also increasing in cost. Purchase that ahead of time. And then we're going to bid out most likely the, the pump station and the land treatment site first and then follow that with the forest main, the two segments of the forest main. This way, us purchasing the materials ourselves saves us about 20%. And I think originally, I think we were looking at, um, it's like over a million dollars and that's just the materials, nothing else that we'd be saving on. So, but also trying to make sure we're going to have it in, in time to actually get it installed. So. This is something we've been working on the last few weeks, talking with the engineers, talking with um, some contractors, you know, just trying to get an idea of what we can look at it in regards to costs and, you know, delivery times and all that, so. Will you take possession of the material or will it be just in time delivery? We haven't worked that out yet. There's, we've, we've considered two methods. Um, at least one of the suppliers that we've talked to has indicated they'd be willing to keep it on their yard and then deliver it to the site for the contractor. Um, and we've also talked about them delivering it to us and then us making it the contractors, you know, turning it over to the contractor in their possession once we select the contractor. So we haven't completely worked out but the important thing for the manufacturers or the suppliers is they can run all the pipe at once. They don't have to set up multiple runs. They're dealing with just us. They're not having to deal with multiple contractors. Um, and from what the, at least the feedback we've gotten from the contractor community, they really like this because it takes a lot of their fluctuation out of, so they, they feel like they'll be able to give much tighter bids because they're not having to coordinate with the supplier, lock in prices, which is difficult to do right now. Um, and in addition, we got some uh, feedback and, you know, again, this is feedback. I have no real way to verify whether this is true, but it does make sense. Um, you know, some of these projects are getting in the, uh, many of these breaking them in separate contracts are getting in the $10 million range. Well, what's happening, well, the contractors are worried about, especially some of those middle tier contractors, is if you've got pipe prices that are continuing to fluctuate or increase, um, it's getting, uh, you know, for a middle tier contractor, that's getting at the upper end of their range anyway. Now you add fluctuation on top of that and they run into bonding problems or, or things like that. So by doing this, we actually may enable some contractors to bid that may would have otherwise been, you know, worried to bid a project like yeah. this. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So uh, while we don't have a way to verify that, it, you know, in the feedback that we've gotten, that does make sense because we're taking a lot of the variability out of it by purchasing. Um, and again, there's things that have to be worked out, you know. Who actually owns the pipe once the contract is let from the contractor? You know, whose responsibility is it if, you know, pipe gets damaged or, you know, if, if pipe is stored, especially if it's a, a PVC, the biggest, you know, the biggest concern for PVC is sun, UV. It does not hold up well to UV light. It becomes brittle. Um, so making sure that it stays covered and protected and those kind of things. So, um they're not hurdles we can't overcome, we will, but we just, you know, we're, we're working on that right now. But well, at this everything- point, you're not considering taking possession of this material yourself and having to have some place to put it, i.e. renting a lot or putting it at some inconvenient place like land app. Well, we are considering, we are considering it, it'll be what is best, what works best for what gets the city the best price with the least risk? So um, if we do have to store it, Land App is a great place. So it's, it's easy access. That's where the pipe is going to terminate anyway. So we're actually looking at 
that as being a viable option. Um, it's a concern the, that I ask about because that amount of material, you're not going to put it off Western Boulevard. At that's your, right. It's <laughs> It'll be a significant amount of material, but we do have the room for it. Okay. Um, and then if we do that, we would, you know, what we would do is have, you know, the pipe run, you know, they may run the pipe together, but it be packaged as the two separate contracts. So they, the, the suppliers, the manufacturers have the plans so they can see what we're looking at. So it's, um, and, you know, just to, to give you an indication, we're looking at not only that, but we're looking at pipe materials too. So we're looking at PVC, HDPE, and um, ductile iron. And right now, the HDPE is the best price. And it's a material that I really like. You know, it's it holds up well. It's what they use a lot of in Alaska. And if it's, you know, it, there's, um, you know, now there are some downsides to it. It is not real resistant to somebody boring into it or hitting it with a backhoe. You know, ductile iron would be much more rigid in that case. But when you're talking corrosiveness and just... Um, the lifespan of the pipe, HDPE, has a lot of benefits. But And right now, um, from what we're seeing, it's the cheapest by about, you know, a little over a million dollars probably. So some of those projects are not, <clears throat> not anything you could push out. I mean, you know, obviously prices of materials are way up now. But, That's right. But, but they will, you know, there will be some adjustment. They probably will not go back where they were two years ago, but... Well, there, and, there, there will be adjustment beyond where we're, where we sit today. And what we're, you know, in the initial conversations that we've had, the, um, by being able to run it all at once or run it as part and not be tied to a specific contractor's timeline, yeah. we take a lot of those additional variables out of it to yeah. where the increase is not as significant. Yeah. Um, and then one of the reasons, as Randa mentioned, that we're looking at moving forward with the station itself is because um, under, you know, doing the detailed review of the station, the materials are not as largely affected as um, it, in the station as they are at, at like pipe prices. The right. prices are not as volatile. Yeah. So, and, you know, we... For some of our other projects, we're seeing we're still seeing very competitive bids um, relative to where we have been recently. So, you know, if it's something that looks way out, then obviously we would we would pause and yeah. and, and back up. But so far, all indications are pretty good. It just doing this, you know, should help us to the idea is that you know we minimize any additional increases. Gotcha. Or lift station elimination. This one, uh, I think we're looking at. This one is supposed to be bid out this month, but this is where we're going. Actually, we've already started work. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. and I have a picture on the next one. Um, we're eliminating the Decatur lift station or pump station. Um, and we've already started to clear the area. The majority of it is cleared out. Um, we've started to uh, place some of the new manholes in. Um, but the whole, this is going to, we're going to construct 1,700 feet of the 15-inch sanitary sewer. We're going to run it along the back portion behind Royal Bluff, and it'll tie in with the Brookview gravity sewer trunk over there. Um, this is a picture from, I think, like last week. I'm working on coring the manhole there. But the pipe has been delivered. Um, they've already started setting the new manholes and everything. We're estimating they, they'll be complete by November. And with the looks of it, I think it was out there Wednesday. Um, it's been moving along fairly quickly. So uh, I, I happened to speak to someone yesterday that lives along that road and they noticed how much they'd lost at the back of their lot there is some of that going to be reclaimed or re 
refurbished or I mean, there sits. is some, I can't remember exactly how much, like in the contract, uh, where certain areas they're supposed to put it back, but there is, I don't remember the significant or the specific amount, um, as far as like what's supposed to be replaced. added back. He said he's, like, now he's got like a four out. foot drop at the end of his yard, you know, that used to be different. I, I haven't been there myself, but it just, if if there is cut and fill associated with yes. this project. Yeah. That means cut, cut dirt out and then bring dirt in at the in. end. Oh, okay. okay. And some of it, when you're, when you're digging like this, you know, you see the trench box, which is probably eight or 10 foot, uh, probably an eight or 10 foot tall trench box. Mm -hmm. But you know what, from the angle this is taken, you know, you notice that the sides slope away from that. So to get as deep as they are, they're having to dig way back and still use a trench box at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, that hole's probably 20 or 30 feet wide if I had to guess based on that trench box. So, you know, it's, it's benched way back. So some of that will be filled back in I mean, when I, they're this done. This manhole, will that be level with the ground or I, it's gonna, Close, it's I don't know that it'll be, I don't know that right. the room will be exactly level to, with the ground, but it'll be real close. It just depends on the area. So yes, I would expect at least the cone where where you see it slope, I would expect at least that to be buried. So I would expect the the earth to come back to at least that level. So there's some hope. So from right. where those guys are standing, <laughs> I would bet that we're coming up ten feet. Okay. I mean, more than likely to end up close to what existing grade was before they started. I would expect okay. so. Very good. We did have some areas that there was a cut, but I don't remember. I, didn't, I don't remember looking at the final plans. And we did have some wetlands that we could um, impact but put back. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll, it, it will not look like this when we're finished. Okay, great. And just one other thing, if I could. The great thing about this project is this is one of those cost-saving things for the ratepayers. We're actually eliminating a station that we have to frequently maintain, ongoing electric cost, you know, all of those things. And we're putting in gravity sewer, which means we're going to let gravity do the work. So we'll just have to, you know, at some point in the future, maintain these gravity lines. But it's not everyday maintenance like we have to do on that lift station and everyday electricity costs. Another project that actually we're basically at the end at this point is the Seminole Trail sewer line. This one um, we replaced the sewer there's certain segments there on um seminole and sue uh, they finished that up about a week ago and i think they're almost if not completely finished with the paving they're kind of going through the punch list the final things that they need to finish up right now but that one it took a little bit longer than we had anticipated <laughs> but it's done um, that one was another one that came about through i and i you know the road conditions as well but through i and i and seeing that failure of the infrastructure there so that's why we went in there and did that one but like i said that that one should be done by next week like with everything at this point We also have the coal drive infrastructure. This is another one. This is both water and sewer that we're looking at replacing. Um, it's the section that goes into the Bell Fork home community there. It's the main entrance. And what kind of brought us out there was the road condition, uh, the roads failing because the infrastructure is deteriorating underneath. So we did some testing and looked at it. We're finishing up with the videos right now. Um, and then looking at that segment, we'll figure out the best route to go as far as the repairs for that. But uh, we're hoping to have something by the end of October in regards to what we plan on doing and how we plan on getting it out. And that is it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Andrew. Andrew. We appreciate it. Good presentation. Appreciate it. <clears throat> okay. Moving on to open discussion. Uh, does anybody have any questions for her, I guess, for we make a runaway? No questions? Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Open discussions. We have any open discussions anybody want to bring up? Okay. For me, uh, I'm sorry. The, uh, 
This has been very educational as far as any of these presentations. And in lines one that hasn't been involved with is about how much work goes into keeping the city run, running. And, and what's helped me a lot is that I attended through the, uh, this, uh, the academy that the city produces. It shows you all the back things that most people don't see. And as all these presentations were going, my thought is the value of the education on uh, letting the public know that, hey, guys, this is what you need to do to save money, to recycle, do all those things that people take for granted that would save lots of money to keep all these projects going. Because I know costs are going up, but at the same time, as you were saying earlier, sir, that, hey, there's got to be a, a point that, as a citizen, you got to think, well, how can we keep the cost down? Because nobody likes high bills. And knowing things like this helps us a lot. That's exactly right. Appreciate that. Matter of fact, they do an excellent job. The city really does an excellent job in their presentations. They always have, and I don't see anything falling off of that, that wagon. They, you, you guys do a great job like tonight. It was awesome presentation and appreciate it. It's very educational, like you said. I and, could add one thing since yes, Mr. Schiffelbaum said it. You know, for water and sewer system, um, obviously we have water conservation, you know, energy efficient appliances. You know, our, our washing machines of today use a quarter of the water our washing machines 10 years ago used. But the sewer system, if we could just get people not to dump grease, oils, you know, fats down there and, and keep things out of their garbage disposal, we would go a long way in some of our everyday maintenance and actually all four of our wastewater overflows that we've had in the last, I, I think we've had four or five, and they've all been attributable to things that are people are putting down their drains that they shouldn't be. So if, you know, if the one thing residents could do the most to help us is can the grease. I think everybody's heard that slogan, yeah. but that would be a major benefit to the wastewater system and save a lot of money. As far as education goes, one of the things I'll remind all the board members is this is being broadcast on G10. And so any question you have is not only should be asked, but should be asked because somebody in the audience probably has the same question. And because it's on the G10, we reach a lot of public and they get to know what we're really looking at for their concern. And it's easy to forget that you're on G10 when you're in this room or in the AB room and you're focused on the agenda item. So. I just remind that to everybody. You can't ask a dumb question because somebody in the audience has probably got the same one and wishing we would ask it. I'd also like to say that as a board member, you'll find now they know you're on the board, you're going to get asked the same question like I brought up today. I look at it as we're like ambassadors. You know, we're, we're also promoting the city and the water and all that to the public so that they are better educated if we can help. And that's part of our job as board members. So thank you all for participating. Any other discussions? Okay. Well, then the next meeting will be October 14th. A reminder, in case you're not aware of it, it's every second Thursday of the month, unless Wally tells us not to show up. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's always plan it for that 530 right here or in this building normally. No other. Uh, I make issue. a motion to adjourn. That's what I was going to ask Second. for. Second. All right. Adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Awesome.